Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate being able to present this information with our co-managing director, Michael Martyr, and my partner as well, um, on how we are all addressing Zoom, both in our litigation practice, trials, hearings, as well as in our client communications. And again, we truly appreciate you taking the time to learn with us, share with us, and to understand a little bit about what we're addressing because you'll very likely be addressing it as well. And when we get to the question and answer point, share with us some items that you're addressing that we may not have covered. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. Good morning and thank you, Beth Ann. And uh, it's an honor for me to be able to do this uh, webinar. Thank you all for joining. And it's an honor for me to be joined by my partner, Beth Ann. So if we can go to slide four, and uh, that a little bit tells us why we're here, the advent of the digital legal proceeding. We probably would have gotten here eventually, but I think it all happened uh, much faster than anybody expected with courts closing, travel restrictions. I know Michael and I both travel all over the country for many hearings, and given that we're not really flying that many places, we had to find another way to keep our matters moving forward because that generally is what's best for our clients and that's our goal. And uh, really the point of today, a little bit of it, is that if after 30 years of practice, I can in essence learn a new way to present and advocate for my clients, uh, we all can and we all should and we should all be able to plan for the best way to do it just as if you were planning for the best way to appear in court. And Michael, I think you uh, might have a few more years on me, but you're doing this just as well, right? Well, for over almost, almost, almost 43 years now. And when I started, we didn't have computers. Uh, we didn't have, uh, when I was in law school, we did not have Westlaw or LexisNexis. We had books and you had to put your nickels or dimes into the copy machine and stack your books up to make copies. And okay, so I, you I thought to, you were going to say there were tablets, but that's good. <laughs> but yeah, so, so we didn't. We had mag cards and we had uh, mail, and so uh, this has been a learning curve for all of us to be able to operate in a completely new world. And um, while we will normalize somewhat, I think this is going to be a thing for years I to come. I agree. So let's go on to slide six um, because we want to show you some of the things that are so far being used for Zoom and some of the things that are not really being used quite so much. And Michael, you can address the jury trials that I think haven't really started, in, at least in the civil world, as much. And maybe you can explain why. Well, I spoke to a judge, a uh, friend of mine yesterday, actually. Uh, who is in the criminal bench. And they're, they're having uh, difficulties, especially you have the speedy trial rule, which in most cases are being waived. They're not doing many jury trials. They're doing preliminary hearings. They're doing uh, motions, suppression motions, things like that. But you're not seeing any, many jury trials in where I am in Orange County. Uh, there are no uh, jury trials at all taking place. Uh, for that matter, uh, there are very few non-jury trials that are taking place except emergencies. If you have, you know, injunction hearings or, you know, cases that involve high degree of sensitivity, those cases are going forward. Typical motion practice, evidentiary hearings, summary judgment motions, motions to dismiss, uh, even case management conferences, short matters, all of those things are occurring uh, remotely today, as well as depositions and arbitrations and mediations. Right. So it's interesting because I actually think that some of the pre-trial litigation work will move faster now that we're able to use Zoom. And I think 
that part will be here to stay. I'm not convinced that jury trials on Zoom will be here to stay. I know especially Miami-Dade County did a major experiment that apparently went very well, but I believe that non-evidentiary hearings, obviously mediations and some depositions, it will be here to stay. And my experience in the non-evidentiary hearings have been almost better sometimes than evidentiary hearings. I think that everybody is very focused on the screen pretty much, and there are fewer distractions both from the judges as well as the litigants because there are fewer people in the courtroom, and thus far it's gone well. Mediations is also a very big area because people are all over the country, and now you're able to use breakout rooms, which we'll get to in a minute, to gather people. So for example, Michael's in Orlando and I'm out of state, and it's as if we're sitting right next door to each other. Now, um, there is a huge issue though, especially with depositions. So let's go to slide seven. So even though this may seem a little less formal, you still have to be very, very careful about the rules of professional responsibility and client confidentiality. And Michael, I know that you've addressed this uh, with agreements in writing, if you wouldn't mind addressing that now. Well, it's not only agreements, but many things happen on the fly in the course of a deposition. Um, main thing is because you are not present with the witness or their counsel, you want to make sure that there is no communication occurring, sidebar communication between opposing counsel and the witness while the witness is still testifying. Uh, it's very hard to do, but, you know, uh, for the unscrupulous, and I hope there aren't that many, it could be hand gestures, it could be, you know, uh, some type of body language, uh, it could be whispers. It can be all kinds of things that are going off uh, off screen that you can't necessarily monitor. And you do want to have an agreement that um, that there is to be no communication, no coaching. And some some lawyers I've had that are kind of uh, take offense to that. Uh, who me? Why would I dare do that? But those are the people that you have to worry about the most. Thou dost protest too much. Uh, <laughs> So, and, one uh, thing, go ahead, sorry, Beth Ann. Sorry, one thing that uh, I have had happen in some of our cases is we have actually been scanning the room to see where the doors, the windows, and other individuals might be hiding or lurking. And that has actually been entered into some of the orders that that type of scanning, because the concern is um, opposing counsel can be in one room on a Zoom video and there could be an associate or, and not just counsel, it could be somebody's husband or somebody's wife or somebody's child who's coaching the witness inappropriately. Um, we also have to address the fact that in many states, depositions are public hearings. So although you might wanna put in place confidentiality and use um, uh, pass codes, in some states you actually have to make the deposition public unless you have an order allowing you to seal it. Um, so that is something else that you have to be aware of before you do it. And now, if we go to the next slide, we one can other thing I'd like to interject in addition to what Beth Ann just said: make sure you know who's in the room. You may have a witness testifying, and there may, may be another witness in the room who you don't know about, who may be sharing information or trying to coach the witness. So. It's important to know who is who is present and the same instruction uh, to counsel uh, in terms of intervening or coaching the witness should apply to any other people that are in the room. They may want to facilitate a discussion. Correct. And this, Michael, we've gotten a comment and a question. This also applies in the context, especially really in arbitration where you may, you may or may not have an order, but again, some people may think that that's somehow less formal than trial. It's really not, uh, but it's something to be very cautious of. I have found it uh, helpful to scan the room. I think that that's sort of a precaution. And once uh, people ask, know that that's gonna happen, they may act differently. Um, the fact is you can't stop some bad actors from doing things they're not supposed to do, but I think you can at least think about it in advance. Um, which brings us up to what's on the screen again, 
which says, do not make your meetings public, do not share the link, join before the host setting, things of that option. Zoom actually gives you lots of different options, as does WebEx or all of the other uh, platforms that you're able to do. But again, you have to be conscious in the litigation mode of what you're allowed to make confidential and what you're not allowed to make confidential. Um, which brings us to our next slide, slide number 10. Researching the local rules. This is really important because it's not going to be in the books that we all have sitting on our desks anymore. Now it's going to be on the judge's website or um, uh, scheduling order or something to that effect. So you need to be very, very careful to know what your judges are doing. So for example, in a recent hearing, one of our judges requires, it's a hearing that had 20 attorneys on it, that every attorney who's not speaking directly to an issue must turn their cameras off. And in that way, the judge was able to focus on who was speaking and maybe the adversary was on as well. And it actually worked very well because again, you weren't being distracted by other people. In this case, there were about 20 of them doing something else while somebody was speaking. And um, the other thing that some of the judges are doing is they're setting stricter time limits because it's harder for the judge to make sure that people uh, say complete their arguments without being in the same room. Michael, have you experienced that at all? I haven't experienced that, but I will say, uh, as a side note, when you're in a Zoom hearing or in a deposition, the professional demeanor it be becomes even more important. You're still in a courtroom, even though you may be in your office or maybe in your house or wherever you may be doing uh, the hearing from, you have to make sure that you're observing the highest ethical standards and, the, and your appearance is important. And I think Beth Ann mentioned it. Um, you have to act the same way as if you're actually in a courtroom. Do you want to be standing or do you want to be sitting? Are you more comfortable? Do you feel more empowered when you're standing maybe at a podium or at a desk, you know, with your exhibits as opposed to sitting in a stationary manner? Uh, you should try to do your hearing in the same way you would do it as if you were in a courtroom. Um, so that you're, you know, you kind of have your mojo and some people don't get the same, uh, the same feeling sitting at a desk or not being in a courtroom as they would uh, on Zoom. So try to do it in the same way that you would do it as if, as if you were actually live in a courtroom as much as possible. I fully agree, Michael, and we're even going to get to some setting the stage items shortly. Um, let's go to the technical matters because that also relates to you being in a courtroom. Now, many of you, I don't know what your practices are, but very often I literally will go to the courtroom where I'm about to have a major hearing a day or two in advance. I'll check out their electronic commitment equipment. I'll go with my trial tech. We just want to set everything up in advance. And I'm not sure if you can see Michael and I on screen. Uh, and I guess the text will let us know. But it's very important in this context to also set up in advance. And in fact, the picture on this PowerPoint scares me. Why? There's a cup right next to the computer. Because I could envision that cup falling over and ruining the computer. And for me, I had uh, an issue this morning with my Wi-Fi. So I have a backup Wi-Fi. It sounds like it will never happen, but the last thing you wanna do is keep your adversary or your, well, maybe your adversary, but keep the judge or a witness waiting because of failed equipment. The other thing you have to consider is sometimes people blame their equipment. Um, so you might want to send a reminder to your adversary if you want to make sure a deposition goes forward, because I feel like it may be a little bit easier for people to get out of strict deadlines by blaming their equipment. Again, we want to think the best of people, but I'm sure we're going to start seeing motions relating to that. And then Michael, um, let's go to slide 14. This uh, our next issue was, uh, we'll come back to breakout rooms. Go to the next one, please. Was setting the stage. And Michael, I can't uh, agree with you more. Now, some people use virtual backdrops. And I don't know if any of you have seen them. 
I personally am not a fan because there's a ghost effect. Depending on what color the um, presenter is wearing, they may go in and out if, if the backdrop uh, has a contrasting or not contrasting enough color. It even happens to judges. I just had one recently, she was wearing her black robe. It looked like she was in the courtroom, that was her backdrop, and then she kept disappearing. So you have to be really careful if you're gonna use a virtual backdrop to make sure that you are wearing the right thing and so that your skin tone matches it so you don't disappear because it's very, very distracting at times. I also think if you can go to the next stage that you need to practice. Um, right now you can tell I'm behind a plain wall. Michael's pretty much behind a plain wall. You can set the background that you want. For example, when I'm using Zoom for interviewing people or for meeting new clients or for doing something else, sometimes I'll have artwork behind me and, and I'll find a space in either my home or my office that looks appropriate. So just be intentional about what your background looks like. You'll see by these pictures, somebody slouching back is not going to be as effective as somebody sitting up straight, just like in court. You're gonna be sitting at council table and you're gonna want people to know that you have command of the room. Same thing with the lighting, prepare it in advance to the extent you can because it makes a difference. You want to be able to make eye contact. And Michael, coming back to what you were saying about hearings, um, I, the one that I had where 20 different attorneys were on and arguing in the same case, it was very interesting to see what the different lawyers did. Some of them did use a podium. The ones who appeared more effective, though, were able to use the podium and have the camera zoom in so you could still see their face. Other people used a podium, but it was too far away, so it was as if you were not connecting with the person. Um, it really is going to be up to you, and you have to make the strategic decision, but know that it makes a difference. People are going to see a different different things. And these pictures to me show it perfectly. And then Michael, I think you wanted to add about obviously what you're wearing, how you're prepared, all of that. Dress the way you would if you were in a, an office or a courtroom. Uh, that means be professional and the same for your witnesses. Just because this is a Zoom proceeding doesn't mean that there's a, a no dress code. The dress code is the same as it would be if you were taking a deposition live or doing a hearing in court. And, you know, one of the things I want to touch on that Beth Ann mentioned, the podium, make it easy on the eyes for the listener. Don't make them strain to hear you or to see you. And so having a good camera angle, having good lighting and having a presence, it'll help the trier a fact uh, and law, the judge in this case, pay more attention. Uh, if you're, if you're, if they're hearing you and they're seeing you, you'll have a better, a better opportunity to have the judges uh, pay attention to what you're saying. I totally agree. Um, let's go to slide 17, and this relates exactly to what you just said, Michael. Documents, exhibits, and visual aids. Now this becomes a little trickier and I will admit having help at times. If you're doing a major hearing with a lot of documents or major deposition and you're able to have a trial assistant or somebody from your IT help, help you, that is fantastic. If you're not able to have that and if you're more comfortable doing it yourself, do it yourself. But whatever you do, make sure that whoever you need to read that document can read the document. When you see the document on the side here, even though a section is highlighted, you can't possibly read it. So it's got to be either blown up or sections excerpted out to make sure that somebody can read it. And again, less is more. Now, in addition, what I've been doing in some of my cases, if the judge will permit it, I'm one who tends to use notebooks and binders of cases. And I still need to be able to have the judges look at those cases. And some judges are able to look at two screens and pull up the cases and it takes a while. Other judges are not. So communication is key. I've been calling those judicial assistants and asking if I can still send 
a what I'll call a safe binder to the judge prepared by our copy centers who use gloves and masks. So the judge and I can be looking at the same thing because I know that some of those judges are not going to look at their screen or have that capability. And it has actually worked very well. I usually position myself at the end of the table. So I'm looking head on to the judge and I have the same notebook in front of him or her that the judge has. Um, the other thing is timing. You have, just like you're in court, if the judge is looking at something and reading something, you have to pause. You have to know, okay, the judge is absorbing that or not absorbing that. If the judge looks bored, you need to speed it up and keep moving. It's just like you're in court. So you have to just not look at your notes and not look at the documents, but look at the judge in the face. Michael, you have anything to add regarding documents? Agreed. Make sure I would not attempt to do uh, one of these proceedings without a tech in the room to help because, um, first of all, I'm ill-equipped to do it. But secondly, um, if you're trying to manipulate documents, you're not able to be thinking about what you're actually arguing or saying about the document. You need to be able to move quickly and seamlessly through your presentation. So having someone available to help you bring up whatever exhibit you want to see, uh, blow up an exhibit, uh, zoom in on a, a particular a paragraph or, or deposition excerpt, uh, those are all things that you have to be able to do on the fly quickly. And you don't want to be fumbling around because you just sim simply don't have the time to do it. And uh, judges will grow impatient if you're kind of uh, fumbling and bumbling through documents and technologies, uh, technology issues, as opposed to being able to move quickly and seamlessly through your presentation. And, and I would add to that, make sure you don't try to do this the first time right. uh, in front of your judge. Practice what you were going to be presenting if possible. Uh, we're going to get to this in a minute, but when you're doing these Zoom presentations, you don't have all of the travel time, uh, getting on an airplane, getting into a hotel room, leaving a hotel room, leaving your office, going up the courtroom elevator. All of those things uh, are much more efficient and cost effective when you don't have, have to do them. In lieu of that, practice going through your documents and exhibits before you have a hearing, a deposition, or a trial, so you're not fumbling around. I completely agree. I was, I was about to say exactly the same thing. In, in many instances, with many of us working remotely or working alone in our offices, um, some things take a lot longer. But especially going to court and waiting in court, all of those things are sped up dramatically. Um, I have found every hearing I've attended the judge has been exactly precisely on time. Uh, I can't say that I've heard of other stories for other people, but so far in my cases for special set hearings, the judges have been on time. So use the time that you're saving exactly from traveling or going to check out the courtroom in advance to practice. Um, it's very, very important. And the judges will appreciate it. I've spoken to quite a few and they appreciate you both speaking to their court staff in advance to make sure that they're ready for you and that you're ready for what the judge is expecting as well as you practicing. Now, um, if we can go to slide 23, I, I also wanted to address today other uses because we don't always go to court. We don't always have depositions, but I'm finding using Zoom in my everyday life with my clients and my work and my you know, charitable work as well has been fantastic. And I wanted to use board meetings as an example. I'm on a board with about 26 adults. And very often when you're at a big boardroom table, there'll be a lot of side conversations. And I find that with a Zoom meeting, that doesn't happen because obviously I can't talk to one person on Zoom and not have everybody here. So I think people pay attention more, the meeting goes a little bit faster and there are fewer distractions. Yet you still get the social aspect because what happens is people sign on about 15 minutes early and they linger on. 
So if you have a board of 26 people, instead of having clicks of two or three people, it's almost as if all the board members get to interact. So I actually find that to be a benefit for Zoom meetings. And I believe that some of my boards will continue to do those meetings in addition to hopefully the more social aspects, but the actual conducting of the meetings, I believe is better. Michael, have you experienced that? I agree. Well? And I've had, I'm, I'm on a board, uh, a law school board, my, uh, from my from where I graduated law school, we just had an overseers meeting two weeks ago, and uh, same thing. I do like the uh, using the gallery so that you can see everybody that's in the meeting, uh, and it worked. It works fine, of course. Listen, at this point, after seven or eight months of this, I think we all would like to be a little more interpersonal. It gets old uh you like to have the human contact the camaraderie uh but this is the next best thing and i think it's going to be uh, a thing of the future a lot of people can't maybe can't make a board meeting out of town or can't uh get to a place or they're running late or they would do a meeting that they might not otherwise get to because they have a client meeting or something in the office they're running late they can't get there and it's really going to be very uh, convenient to do these Zoom meetings into the future because it's just a time saver. And you'll probably be able to get to more events and more meetings than you would have if you had to get in your car and drive. I agree. And um, the next part that I want to address is clients. So we're constantly talking in whatever business you are, and I know there may be people on, on who are not attorneys, about connecting with your clients or connecting with your colleagues. And again, it's very expensive and time consuming sometimes to travel out of state. Right now you have a great excuse because you can't do it in many instances, but this is really a good way to connect very personally with your clients or your contacts. And I, I included experts and applicants as well. And for those types of interactions, you might not want the plain wall behind you. You might want something that is sort of a conversation starter, either art or uh, in my home office, there's a treadmill behind me usually, and we have an interesting conversation about that because that's interpersonal and that gives you something to talk about. And very often, especially in our practices, our clients are all over the country. So we don't always get to see them except in really the most stressful times of depositions or trial. So use this as an opportunity to reach out and speak to your clients face to face. Same with experts and applicants. Uh, I've been doing a great deal of interviewing people who wanna come work with us using Zoom. And frankly, I find it almost better, certainly more efficient and certainly costs a lot less money. And um, so much so that I think some of the interviews are going longer uh, because it's as if we're having a conversation and I don't have my secretary sitting outside the door or two attorneys who need to speak with me, et cetera. And, and I think it's been very effective. Same with expert witnesses. I found it to be very, very effective. Agreed. Yeah, and the other thing is, and I've, I've been reading about these trends, it also allows us to broaden our searches. So for example, with people being all over the country, it's much easier to deal with experts out of state um, and to help you decide how they will perform on the stand because you're able to have a Zoom meeting. And I think that that saves our clients um, a ton of money. I really do. So um, we have a few questions coming in and some of them are relating to new regulations regarding video recording Zoom calls. And I appreciate the person asking that question. Um, this is a grave concern of mine and something that I know happens all the time because depending on what state you're in, there are two consent states or one, con you know, one consent states, you really are not supposed to be recording something without the consent of anybody else. Yet we can imagine somebody pulling up their phone and taking a picture of the screen. Taking a picture is a little bit different than recording and uh, the 
the only way rules that I know right now, other than the regular state statutes and when you can record somebody or not, is will they be able to use that on an evidentiary basis? And if they didn't have your consent to record it, they certainly won't be able to use it down the road. But that's another example of surveying the room before you start a Zoom proceeding, et cetera. Um, I have already seen many, many pictures of the Zoom screens. I'm sure you've seen it all online. And I'm not sure yet of any way to prevent somebody from taking a picture of the Zoom room. Have you had to handle that at all, Michael? Haven't had to handle that, but it's a, yeah. probably a simple matter to address. You can do it by saying, uh, we understand that there are no recordings uh either audio or visual of this proceeding or if you feel like you want to record something does anybody have any objection if we record the meeting and that's a perfectly good way to handle it and if you're going to do that uh then say listen i'm happy to share the the materials with anybody who wants it and uh in most of the depositions that i have done they're all video recorded anyway so we have even though they're on Zoom, there's still video of the deposition uh, or the proceeding. So uh, it's a simple matter. Either if you don't want it recorded, make sure that it's not happening. And if you feel like you may want to record it, just ask if anybody has any objection. And to uh, expand upon that, somebody else has also asked about body language. And I know, Michael, you'll be able to address that. but. My goals on body language is making sure that my camera is as close as possible for me to be able to see how the judge is reacting to what I'm saying. And the witness, I want to be able to see is the witness shifting his or her eyes? Are they looking to the side as if they're reading a cue card? Um, I imagine that going forward, there'll be, if this really sticks in our cases, there are artificial intelligence programs. So for example, the California bar exam that's taking place next week, they literally have a camera and a monitor on each person so they can tell if they're gazing off for too long for purposes of cheating. And I imagine that uh, if this becomes a regular practice, those types of products will become more readily available to assist us. But for right now, Michael, you wanna address the body language component? It's it's important, and I, I think I touched on this before, that as, at least for your body language and for your client's body language, you try to replicate what you would do in a courtroom. Uh, you don't want your witness shifting, looking back and forth, up and down, uncertain, uh, nervous. Uh, you don't want, the, want this kind of thing. If, uh, if, if, if it's your witness and they're being questioned, you know, uh, you can kind of tell after doing this a long time when someone's not being truthful, you've probably already had, had a statement so you know when they're not being truthful. You know when they're waffling or, or, or changing their story, uh, you know, uh, even with opposing counsel, uh, if they're if they're visible on the screen, you know, don't be um, making gestures or doing things that would suggest that you're not happy. You know, I've always uh, when 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 we have jury trials and you have an objection, you go up to the bench, even though you hate the ruling, you should never walk back to your chair as if you just lost something you should be walking back to the chair as if you won the, the biggest hearing of your life because the jury will see the body language. Your client will see the body language. And if you're walking back shaking your head or you're not happy or you know, you're, you're exuding a, a, a defeatist attitude, your client's gonna say, what just happened? Did we lose something? Uh, the jury is gonna think that something went wrong and you were slapped down by the judge. So always, no matter what is happening in the case, whether you're arguing a motion, whether it's uh, an objection that's being made, whatever your interaction is, don't ever let the judge or opposing counsel think you're losing your cool and that you think you've been defeated in some way. On the flip side, 
don't glow as if you just won, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the billion dollar lottery, because that doesn't help either, because as quickly as you can have, you know, something successful happen in a case, the next minute, you're on the other side of it. So uh, it's interesting. So we're being asked some questions about use of exhibits. And uh, one of them is asking, when sharing a screen to show exhibits, what should you say on the record so it's clear it's not appropriate for the other side to take pictures or access materials you're sharing? Interestingly, in the context of a deposition or a trial, I'm not so sure it's not inappropriate. I'm not so sure it's inappropriate for them to take pictures because generally anything you're putting in front in front of the judge should be shared either in public or with the other side technically even before you put it on the screen and i think that you need to address those things in advance now we all like to come up with surprise documents um at hearings etc but if you're going to do that i would have a full copy available and if your adversary um, comes up with a document and only shows a portion of it to a witness you presumably would know that document exists so you would do a regular cross-examination just like you would in any proceeding and say now didn't you just look at page two of that 10-page document let me turn your direction your attention to page eight that's how i would probably handle that um, if it's a true surprise then you'd have to act just like you're in court if somebody handed you a document and didn't have it accessible if they're showing it on the screen to the judge then you're able to look at the document and take a break in the proceedings to address it exactly as you would in court. Michael, have you had to address that's, that yet? No, that's, what you just said is accurate, that's fine. So I've, I've been asked about some silver linings and if it's here to stay. My view is, I uh, and many of my cases are in federal court, so I feel as if the federal judges are probably uh, issuing orders a lot faster because they don't have lawyers in front of them taking up a lot of their time. So I do believe that for things like case management hearings, settlement conferences, things that I used to get on a plane for, even though it was just an hour hearing, I do think Zoom is going to be an option. I think it's a much better option than telephone hearings. I never really loved telephone hearings because I wanted to be able to see the judge and see my adversary. I don't think it's going to be here to stay for things like trials or evidentiary proceedings. We are making do and we're doing the best we can, but I think that there's a lot to be said for interpersonal skills when you are dealing with a witness and, um, and a lot to be said for the judge being able to get to feel the real witness when, um, when it's face to face. Uh, the silver lining to me is I think it's going to save our clients a lot of money. Uh, I'm fortunate for some of the hotels, but I do think that the time that we are going to be saving by traveling, I also think that some clients are going to be picking lawyers who are not necessarily in certain jurisdictions. They're going to pick their lawyer or the best lawyer, no matter where they are in the country now, because they know that that person will generally be able to participate from wherever they are. Have you had any experiences with that yet, Michael? I think the silver lining is routine matters especially. I know judges are doing short matters. Instead of going down for a five-minute ex party hearing, uh, you're able to do those things either telephonically or by Zoom. Uh, it's much less wear and tear on the, on the lawyer and the lawyer staff. Uh, when you have to take a cross-country trip for a one-day hearing or a two-day hearing, you know, you may have to, you may have a Monday hearing in Las Vegas or LA or New York, you know, and it's an early morning hearing. You have to leave the night before. You have to check into the hotel. You have to be packed. You have to get back to the airport. I mean, so it, it's much less expensive for the client. And it's much less wear and tear on the lawyer who has to do that trip and make a quick turnaround and maybe, maybe having to have another hearing or another deposition in another case the very next day. And, you know, it's, it's going to be here to stay, I think, in discovery, definitely. And probably some less complex evidentiary hearings where you, don't, where you, where you may have a 30-minute hearing where you 
uh, don't necessarily have to travel or, you know, uh, some of the routine things that don't have a lot of exhibits, motions to dismiss, maybe some of the other types of things that are easily facilitated with, uh, with Zoom. But uh, I believe that this is going to be a thing, at least in part, uh, for the coming years. I agree, although it's interesting because you and I both travel across country, but we also travel in South Florida, just in the you know, tri-county area. So the fact that I can now actually schedule a hearing in Miami the same day as I can schedule a hearing in Palm Beach, as long as they're separated by you know, an hour or two, makes a world of difference. Uh, to me, I would never have taken the chance with traffic, et cetera. So I do think for routine hearings, motion calendar hearings, things like that, it'll be better. And, and I actually think the judges like it better. I think they can make themselves available for hearings on shorter notice because they can fit it in. And I don't know about you, but I've been getting orders on Saturdays, Sundays, et cetera. Uh, so many of the judges are working whenever it is they want to work. And I think that some of them will be setting hearings at those times as well. So uh, Michael, if you don't have anything else to add where, or certainly you can wrap it up, but I think we're gonna wrap it up because I know that they wanna make an introduction for our uh, next panel. And I again, truly wanna thank you all for joining us and we're welcome, you're welcome to offer any questions to Michael and I even after this ends and we appreciated you uh, providing the questions in the chat room as well. Thank you all and uh... Stay sane and stay safe. Thank you.